please welcome Meta's Vice President, Data Center Infrastructure, Dan Rabinovitz. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dan Rabinovitz, and I do hardware stuff at Meta. And I'm going to talk to you about what's happening with Gen AI and all of the challenges it imposes on us on the infrastructure level. So one of the things that's really interesting right now is you might have thought that Gen AI was kind of in its hype cycle. But what we're seeing with the emergence of Gen AI now integrated into messaging apps, into consumer electronics devices, is that the number of actual inferences are starting to grow at a very, very fast clip. And these are useful things um, that are now enabled so fantastically well by the fact that we've trained these large language models and they've become quite productive. And the next generation are going to combine machine learning with Gen AI, extended reality, so that you can actually get really cool use cases like real-time language translation, looking through your glasses to tell you what something is, or what is that leak thing and what do I do about it? These kinds of use cases are going to drive way more inference transactions on our infrastructure, which just means that Gen AI is on a roll right now, and we should just expect this tsunami to continue. But just a very short time ago, in 2022, <laughs> which is, as many of my colleagues have said, less than a year ago, we were focused on deep learning recommendation models, which are really the models for our company that tie people to the content they love. And we were optimizing these things around memory and I.O. bandwidth, largely. We weren't really compute intensive in the same way as Gen AI. Fast forward just a very short time later, Llama was trained with 65 billion parameters, 400 times the amount of flops required. We needed 10 times the memory capacity. And as you can see, now we're not talking about like one GPU, but we're talking about 20 times the amount of GPUs to do these kinds of training jobs. So pretty dramatic change. And we're not done. We actually don't know where diminishing returns are for generative AI models and large language models. So this is just more to come. And I think we should expect that we're going to continue to get challenged on the scale and the complexity and the evolution of these models. And the models themselves will change. So we really need to expect the unexpected here. The only thing we can look at right now is all of this complexity is posing a gigantic challenge for us in the industry. So we could have made this a much more granular picture, but these are five dimensions that are reasonably well taxed by different kinds of AI workloads. And I want to talk about this in the context of generative AI, large language models, and ranking and recommendation for inference and training, so that you can kind of get a visual for what are the most taxed dimensions as we look at these different kinds of models. So if we look at large language models, these are trained with billions and trillions of parameters. They require a huge amount of scatter and gather transactions. And that's needed across thousands of GPUs to get sufficient flops to process these jobs. And if you, if you look at this super duper compute intensive, lots of network bandwidth required. The inference phase for LLMs is split into two phases, prefill and decode. And the prefill phase is very compute and memory intensive, requiring up to 10 petaflops just to get to that first token. And think about this in the context of what we just watched. Um, because now we also have to think about the decode phase is very sensitive to latency, to network latency and memory bandwidth, because those tokens are processed one at a time. So you want things to come in as fast as possible so that when you're asking your, your chat message bot what to do, you don't have a long lag. You get really good response time. Now switching over to ranking and recommendation, if you look at DLRMs, they have large embedding models that are mapped across machines, many, many machines. And that results in a high demand for network bandwidth, because we have a lot of all-to-all -all collectives that are being instantiated in these particular kinds of models. So you can see, very sensitive to network bandwidth. On the inference side, and, and this is really interesting. So if you think about this from, and you know, we'll just put it in the context of our business, we have a lot of this kind of workload. This is a very you know, high demand, high transaction workload for us. So we've been tuning and tuning these models 
to make sure that although they require a lot of memory capacity, we try to minimize the amount of compute bandwidth that's required or the compute capacity. And with all of that tuning and training, this is kind of what these models are really taxing in the data center today. Now, if we overlay all of these, <laughs> you can very quickly see, man, we are like very, very far from having a system solution that could work for all of these different kinds of workloads. It's pretty dramatic. You, know, you pick like four general categories and you end up with this, which is fairly messy. And keeping this in mind, it's really, really important for us to now accept the fact, and I think some of our colleagues uh, said this earlier today, it's hard to find one thing to rule them all. And more, more importantly, coming back to the earlier point, models and parallelism are going to continue to evolve and change. So we don't actually know what will be the, the look and feel of these models going forward. Now, I'm a two-wheeled enthusiast. Um, I, I can actually describe this as sort of a disease. You know, I, I have uh, a lot of bikes. And it's the same problem, right? Some people will say, well, why don't you just have one bike? And I could say, you know, a gravel bike can go on the road, it can go off-road, but it's never going to be as fast as a road bike on the road, and it's never going to go down those gnarly single tracks as well as a full suspension mountain bike. There's trade-offs. Performance per watt is actually a shared metric between cyclists and AI systems engineers. We care about that stuff. And we try to optimize and tune these solutions for the application that we're going after. So it's pretty normal, actually, to try to optimize and get the best performance for the highest, work, you know, the highest uh, uh, volume workload that you're going after in AI. Just like in cycling, you definitely don't want to be riding your mountain bike in a road race, because you will lose to all of the road riders. So where does that take us? This, I think, is kind of like the big, big question for OCP right now. Because if you look at this landscape, how on earth do you take this, you know, this particular situation that we're in right now, especially when you consider that a lot of companies are developing their own silicon, vertically integrating as much as possible, and finely tuning the systems to suit their needs? How do we go from that reality to open and letting lots of companies come into this ecosystem and deliver value so that we don't have to make all of these bespoke solutions. I think the answer is starting to emerge. So the open model is already out there to some extent. And we see this most obviously in, in areas like software frameworks. So PyTorch, Llama 2 being an open model that anybody can use without having to spend the money or the energy to go train models by themselves. These are like good first examples of things that are starting to take off. They have scale. And anybody can basically come in and adopt this, these technologies. And they're being supported by a community, which is really critically important. But if you look at the hardware situation, it's not quite there yet. And today, I would like to encourage all of us to think about a renaissance, a rebirth of this mission around OCP. Now, our AI journey began with Grand Teton, and I'm very pleased to announce that we've contributed this design to OCP. And you can have a look at it. It's, uh, it's uh, available at the, the booth. And importantly, we are eating this dog food ourselves. Grand Teton clusters are in, in production volumes, running in our data centers for both inference and training. And as much as I would like to celebrate this and say this is awesome, and by the way, this is your design, so this is an OCP design, anybody has access to it. It is cool, but honestly, we're still in diapers. Like, this is, this is, you know, this is like uh, toddler time in terms of where we need to go next. And I just want to acknowledge that we are at the beginning of a journey, and we are only 1% done. So what does this look like from a homework perspective? So if we were taking OCP seriously, and it, I, I'm really lucky to be going in this particular speaker slot because so many of my peers and colleagues have been able to already tell a big chunk of this story. But we really need to start with common rack and chassis architectures. And what's cool is, like, just like we talked about with, with bikes, you know, we don't need air cooling for every workload. We're going to need liquid cooling for some of them. But some of them, we do want air cooling. Some, some of these, we want to be able to depopulate some of the network 
bandwidth capability when it's not required. In others, we want to have it fully populated. So starting to think about common chassis and rack architectures that can support all of these different configurations is important because if every single rack and chassis is completely different, it's really hard to scale. So we'll have to accept some compromise on cost, et cetera. But I think leaning towards this, this goal of commonality is really important. A lot of folks have talked about liquid cooling. Liquid cooling is here. We cannot avoid it. It is important. But it is still very early in its, in its life cycle. And we have so many things to work on around cold plate reliability, how we ship things in production, how do we do leak detection, how do we standardize field replaceable CDUs. All of these are kind of open questions. Even just the, the kind of hardware you use for blind make connectors, that's not really been standardized, nor do we have enough qualified vendors who have really robust solutions that we can go to mass production with. This is like definitely number two on the list and very closely related to what we talked about with the common chassis and rack architectures. The next thing, and I will just say, we learned a lot going through the Grand Teton exercise about how hard it is to integrate, validate, and test large AI systems, particularly at the cluster level. Even at the rack level, we found very significant variations in yield when we were not actually testing the subassemblies and the racks by themselves sufficiently so that we could actually continue to like, improve yields in manufacturing. And all of our manufacturing partners are going to struggle with this as they get started because the systems are way more complicated, things are more finicky, and we have to spend more time on this particular area. And this knowledge is not that useful if it's only with two or three companies. It actually needs to be shared more broadly so that the entire industry can actually come up faster to be able to support these in mass production. The next thing to think about is universal tooling and telemetry and software. I was really happy um, to see all of the work around GPU telemetry being standardized, understanding and identifying and isolating silent data corruption in, in the, the field. There's a whole range of things that are going to be really important here. Not least of which is when we start to look at 32,000 and beyond GPU cluster sizes, we have to have good telemetry to, de de to determine what's stopping a job running reliably. And it could be any of 100 or 1,000 things. But without any commonality around that telemetry, we will continue to reinvent all of the reliability engineering that maybe one or two companies will figure out one or two years earlier. That's actually not really helping uh, in terms of getting to scale. And finally, as many of my peers have talked about, we need a unified back-end fabric. And I'm really excited to see that Google announced Falcon today, and Ram was talking about UEC. We applaud these efforts, and we really believe that the industry needs this standard, because this is actually very critical to the future of AI performance. All of this requires sustainability. My colleagues have talked about this in detail. It's incredibly important that we address those uh, you know, upcoming power and cooling needs. So what I want you to take away is AI infrastructure is here. It's growing. It's getting more complex. And we don't know where it's going. OCP is a rallying cry for all of us to step up to the plate and start to address these issues as a community. And by the way, we need a community to do this, because no one company can do this alone. So thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you all in the house. Thank you.